Good morning from Boston. My name is Vikram Patel. I am a psychiatrist and the Pershing Square Professor of Global Health and Wellcome Trust Principal Research Fellow at Harvard Medical School. Welcome to this event. As part of the World Health Summit, we will discuss today in our panel the intersection of COVID-19 with mental health. The importance of mental health has never been as widely recognized by governments, by civil society, and by public health practitioners as during the past two years when the entire world has been caught up in what I consider the first truly global humanitarian crisis. This panel discussion comprising five distinguished voices brings together diverse stakeholders concerned with mental health care, including policymakers, scientists, UN agencies, and the lived experience to share their perspectives on how their particular communities and society more broadly should respond to the historic opportunity to build back better a robust mental health care system in all countries. I think it is important for us to acknowledge that virtually all countries were failing in one way or the other to some degree or the other in meeting the needs of mental health care in their populations. As that need has been greatly increased by the pandemic, the question before all our panelists is how should our countries and the world more generally respond to these needs? The guiding questions for our panel is therefore to discuss the key priorities in mental health care from their particular perspectives of the community they represent, and to discuss the opportunities, challenges, and actions that are needed for addressing the unmet needs for care. And I would hope that we will focus particularly through an equity lens on the low resource communities and contexts in all countries. The country I am in right now, the US for example, is one of the wealthiest countries in the world when it comes to health resources and mental health resources in particular. But yet there are very large unmet needs even in this country. This session is going to be for 90 minutes. And in a moment, I will invite each of our panelists to present their prepared remarks. This will be followed up by questions between different panel members. And finally, we will then have sufficient time to have questions posed by the audience. I would invite audience members to use the Q&A box to post your questions. And if you have a particular panelist you want to ask the question to, please be sure to mention that too. The order of the speakers will be in alphabetical order. And so without much further ado, I will now begin by inviting and introducing the first of our panelists. Dr. Florence Bainana is a psychiatrist and a public health specialist who has worked in mental health policy and programming since 1996. She was the advisor on mental health to the World Bank and is currently with the WHO Afro region as a regional advisor for mental health based in Brazzaville in the Congo. Florence, the floor is yours. Florence, you are muted. Very sorry about that. Thank you very much, Vikram. I just, um, I will start off. Um, I did not prepare any slides. Uh, first of all, thank you very, very much for inviting me to be a part of this um, esteemed panel. Um, to start off, I would like to talk about the burden of um, not just COVID, but emergencies as a whole in the African region. I'm going to speak from the perspective of the African region. So um, all 47 countries have been affected by not just COVID, but also by other emergencies. We have over 129 ongoing emergencies in the African region. 
We have just recently had a new outbreak of Ebola in the DRC. Uh, just very recently, we went through uh, Nirangongo, the, the, the volcano in the, in the DRC as well. And of course, the conflicts going on in Ethiopia, Northeast Nigeria, and Cabo, and Cabo Verde. All of these have an impact on mental health and mental well being. Uh, but the added impact with the COVID is that of um, not just on the mental well-being of individuals affected by it directly, but the healthcare workers as well, who have been under a lot of stress for over one year now. Um, social isolation for the elderly mainly, but the loss of livelihood as well, not just for individuals and households, but for the economy, for the governments as well. And all of these are having an impact on mental health and mental well being. One thing we don't recognize is that NCDs and mental health, even before COVID, were a big burden disorder in the African region. They are number one in the African region if we measure using disability adjusted life years. Among the NCDs and mental health, mental health and neurological and substance use disorders are number one among the NCDs. So this means that it's actually a really big burden that we are facing here in the African region. Uh, another area we don't often talk about in our region is that of suicide. Suicide having a very high rate, six out of the top 10 countries uh, uh, are Swiss, uh, are out of the African region. Um, the next one is that of alcohol and substance use among young people. As we know, the African region has the biggest percentage of young people, 50 to 60% of the population here is people below uh, 18 years of age. And yet we find that 13 to 15 year olds are already consuming alcohol, sometimes up to 42% of the population of this population, 13 to 15 years old. The other very worrying trend is that of 15 to 19 year olds who consume alcohol and then the heavy episodic drinkers. So all these have been going on on top of the COVID that we now have. So if we look at COVID as I move into my key messages is, um, COVID has increased the prioritization of mental health. We know that there has been an increase in the mention of mental health needing to be prioritized. We have discussed it at various high level meetings, most recently at the uh, Paris Mental Health Leaders Meeting. Uh, the Global Mental Health Action plan was endorsed by the WHO assembly and mental health for the first time was discussed at the, at the WHO assembly in May of this year. Within emergency preparedness and response, this is the first time mental health is being discussed within emergency preparedness and response. And the multi-partner trust fund from the UN Multi-Partner Trust Fund for Mental Health and NCDs was also established in May of this year. However, the actual allocation to mental health does not seem to have increased commensurate to the burden of mental health conditions and the various calls and high level meetings. Um, a colleague, Valentina Ayemi, has done a series of um, as, uh, studies and she has published in 2020, 2019, and 2021. She looked at um, development assistance for mental health per se, and this is not commensurate with the Dalis as mentioned. She also looked at development assistance for mental health while it increased, but is still only 0.4% of total development assistance for health. On top of that, uh, while philanthropic contributions as a percentage of development assistance for mental health more than doubled over 16 years, but 
they are still only 0.5% of total philanthropic development assistance for health. So while on the surface, it may seem like mental health um, development assistance and, and philanthropic assistance is increasing on the ground, we actually feel it. Um, it's, still, it's still a challenge. The WHO Mental Health Atlas 2020 also confirms this and would, would actually suggest that African governments actually allocating a bigger percentage of their health budgets to mental health. So while um, the allocation is about 42 cents per capita, but when we look at how much of that is government expenditure, African governments are allocating 2.10% of their government health expenditures to mental health. And the only other region with a higher location is the Euro. Um, this is confirmed when we do analysis of national health accounts. Uh, it could also be that the national health accounts of our governments don't actually capture the development assistance that is provided through philanthropic um, organizations. The response to COVID-19 is also dependent on the strength and resilience of the existing health and mental health systems. And we know that these were already very weak previous to the COVID and so the response has been weak as a result. The WHO Pulse surveys on the continuity of essential health services found that while countries had included mental health and psychosocial supports, support in their COVID-19 response plans, only about 27 had actually fully funded these plans. To conclude, I will say that in response to all the above, I'm glad to say that equity is at the heart of all that we do as WHO. We see the appallingly uneven distribution of mental health resources between and within countries leading to inequities in access to essential mental health services. As WHO, through the Special Initiative for Mental Health, uh, now being implemented in eight countries in all six regions, we are supporting countries to develop strategic frameworks, prioritize activities, budget, and, mo and mobilize resources with a focus on strengthening services at community and primary health care levels. In most countries of the region, we are supporting uh, the strengthening of not just the special initiative countries, but all countries, not just of the region, but globally. We provide support to strengthening of mental health um, through universal health coverage. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Florence, uh, for bringing the very uh, you know, stark facts of the African context into this panel to kick us off. Uh, I think uh, the, the thing that uh, you know, struck me the most was your opening remarks that there are, if I remember correctly, 129 emergencies facing the region, including an ongoing outbreak of Ebola virus disease. Um, and I think this is, of course, a very important context for us to think about how we address mental health problems within this continuing cycle of emergencies while keeping, as you described rightly, the lens on equity, as well as the fact that in spite of all the, the talk about mental health, unfortunately, people aren't walking the talk with actual resources. Uh, and I hope that we will circle back to some of these questions um, during, the, uh, during the discussion to follow. Let me move on to our second panelist. Uh, uh, Dr. Zainab Hijawi is the Senior Mental Health Technical Advisor at the Program Division Director's Office in UNICEF headquarters in New York. Zainab, the floor is yours. Hello, everybody. Um, just momentarily requesting. Great. Um, so yes, thank you so much, Vikram. Um, and good morning uh, to everybody or good afternoon, depending on where you're joining from. Uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak here today. 
Uh, earlier this month, UNICEF launched our flagship State of the World Children's Report, which focuses on child and adolescent mental health for the first time since its publication began in 1980. Uh, in fact, for UNICEF, the key issue of the moment is mental health and is globally one of four priorities for the agency in parity with other priorities like climate, immunization, and education. Now, the mental health field has over a decade of experience in integration within the humanitarian response system and increasingly within developmental settings. Um, with a growing base of evidence, standards, and best practice to safeguard mental health and psychosocial well-being of children, adolescents, parents, and caregivers, especially the most vulnerable populations. But we're still far behind where we need to be. And while mental health is drawing lots of attention globally, as you mentioned, Vikram, it really remains severely underfunded and misunderstood. So let's consider what we know about the scope of the problem. The COVID-19 has undermined many of the foundations that assure children's mental health and well-being and has exposed the extent and severity of the global mental health problem. Children around the world have been locked out of classrooms and robbed of everyday joy of playing with friends. Nearly 77 million children have not set foot in a classroom for the past 18 months. Millions more families have been pushed into poverty, unable to make ends meet, child labor, abuse, and gender-based violence are on the rise. Many children are filled with sadness, hurt, and anxiety. Some are wondering where this world is headed and what their place in it is. There are many challenging times for, these, these are very challenging times uh, for children and young people. But the question is, is this new and is it only COVID? Um, the mental health concerns are not new as uh, Florence was alluding to as well earlier. Uh, even before the pandemic, psychosocial distress and poor mental health afflicted far too many children, including millions who each year are fo forced from their homes, scarred by conflict and serious adversity, and deprived of access to schooling, protection, and support. So it's also not just COVID, right? Today we are witnessing this increased attention on mental health due to this global convergence of conflict, pandemic, natural disaster, climate change, migration and displacement, and political instability, all with heavy implications on mental health and well-being. The impact on the most vulnerable communities and populations, such as those in humanitarian and conflict settings, continuing to be disproportionately high. And even though huge stigma and misunderstanding continues to exist around mental health problems, there's this feeling that the plates have started to shift in recent years and that there's this growing awareness of mental health problems as a concern. The pandemic merely represents a tipping point that helps draw attention to mental health as an issue. It's raised awareness of mental health and highlighted the fragility of services. This is what we also know about the scope of the problem beyond COVID. One in seven adolescents ages 10 to 19 live with a diagnosed mental disorder as defined by the World Health Organization. Half of all mental health conditions start before the age of 14 with three quarters starting before the age of 25. Around the world, almost 46,000 adolescents die from suicide every year among the top five causes of death for their age group. That's more than one young person every 11 minutes. Hear that again one young person every 11 minutes. These are alarming global statistics. Sadly, resources to promote and protect mental health are woefully inadequate. There's almost no response by governments who on average spend just 2% of health budgets on mental health, only a fraction of which is diverted to children and families, which means they spend basically nothing on promotion of mental health for general population and protection of the most vulnerable groups, such as indigenous kids and LGBTQI plus adolescents who have terribly high rates of mental health issues. And outside of high income countries, there are fewer than zero to one child and adolescent mental health professionals per 100,000 population. Investing in mental health, promotion, prevention, and care interventions can help by reducing risk factors and increasing protective factors at all levels, placing the child at the center and supporting not only a child's individual factors, 
but also factors in their family, environment, culture, and society that in turn have a significant impact on well-being of the child. And so UNICEF's approach to mental health and psychosocial support is threefold. First, it's bringing together different sectors at, as entry points for addressing mental health issues and reaching those children, adolescents, and caregivers most in need. Um, we need a holistic um, approach uh, to response uh, because a lack of this approach remains the cause of significant suffering for children. So only by integrating across sectors and building capacity of each workforce will we be able to prevent and address the varying and complex mental health needs in children. Second, recognizing that the window for intervention starts from before birth. It is critical in early childhood with important windows for opportunity through adolescence and adulthood. In fact, adverse childhood experiences such as abuse and neglect are a major, major preventable cause of mental illness throughout the life course. And by acting early through promoting parents and caregivers to provide supportive, nurturing caregiving at home and promoting mental health support and services in schools, we could prevent poor, often lifelong mental health outcomes. Third, understanding that children's well-being is linked to their environment and is informed by the social ecological framework. In other words, child development and well-being are embedded in a child's own context and experiences tied to relationships with caregivers, friends and family, supports in schools and communities. Of course, including socio socio-cultural influences as well and broader, broader political environment. So as set out in our State of the World's Children Report launched in early October, we are calling for urgent action in the following areas. First, we need urgent investment in child and adolescent mental health, uh, integrated within health, nutrition, education, child protection, and community support systems and children. So not just in health, but to support a whole of society approach to mental health care. Um, we second, we must address stigma at all levels by changing the public narrative around mental health and elevate voices and actions of service users, uh, including youth and caregivers. And so much, of course, needs to be done to address mental health needs, uh, including improved family-centered approaches to mental health and psychosocial care, a more intentional focus on schools and communities to ensure that no child is isolated and that MHPSS services are available for children who need them. And we need to invest in a competent mental health workforce, specialists and non-specialists to improve access and to address the varying mental health needs across sectors. And lest we forget, we need to fill the data gap that helps inform policies and strengthen research and evidence generation in this space. Thank you so much. Um, with that, I conclude my presentation and back to you, Vikram. Thank you so much, Zainab. Um, you know, again, the word equity has come up uh, in, in your presentation as well. And it is so true that uh, marginalized groups of young people um, low-income groups, uh, native uh, 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 indigenous peoples, and, uh, and of course, LGBTQI uh, are, are just another example of how mental health problems disproportionately affect um, subgroups in the population who also face other kinds of disadvantage, historical and contemporary. I was also really, it's also important to hear your remarks about the, the importance of this particular demographic phase of the life course in terms of prevention, uh, because as you rightly point out, there is such a rich evidence base demonstrating that adversities experienced in the first two decades of life are the most consistently demonstrated risk factors for mental health problems that emerge across the life course. And so, of course, this is such a developmentally critical phase uh, for prevention actions. And I'm sure we'll circle back to that, as I know, not least, of course, the impact that the containment policies for the pandemic has had uh, on, on the environmental influences uh, of mental health for children and adolescents. Let me now turn to our third uh, panelist, Admiral Rachel Levine uh, from the U.S. Public Health Services and also an Assistant Secretary of Health at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Admiral Levine serves as the 17th Assistant Secretary for Health at the HHS and the head of the U.S. Public Health Service, Service Commission Corps. Admiral Levine, it's a pleasure to welcome you to this panel. The floor is yours. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Patel, for that kind introduction. Well, certainly during COVID-19, we have globally faced very difficult and challenging time. COVID-19 has been taxing physically and mentally, especially among the world's most vulnerable populations, but we have all felt the strain. 
At the United States Department of Health and Human Services, we certainly agree that mental health has to be one of the core elements to address in the ongoing pandemic and recovery efforts. With a special emphasis on the mental health of healthcare and public health providers, as well as, as is mentioned, children and adolescents. First, COVID-19 has been particularly challenging for medical and public health professionals, both physically and mentally. Their work has been front page news for nearly two years, and it has been their responsibility to address and lead the pandemic response at the domestic and global front. front. And they have faced significant challenges, of course, to their physical health, as well as to their mental health and stability. One important lesson of the pandemic is that we are all interconnected, and we need to ensure that a healthier future includes eliminating health disparities and promoting health equity, especially in the context of emotional well-being and mental health services. The fact is that this pandemic has impacted some communities far more than others, and that underscores the profound disparities in health in the United States and globally. One of the most pressing issues is the impact that COVID-19 has had on our youth, both directly, physically and mentally, and indirectly. Children's mental health during public health emergencies is certainly having short and long-term consequences to their overall well-being. And studies suggest that our youth have and continue to experience emotional trauma and they desperately need our help. Everyone deserves services that are timely, affordable, accessible, equitable, and high quality. Of course, these are our family members, our friends, our neighbors, our school and work peers, and other coworkers. When we talk about mental health, we need to make sure that we include populations that have been marginalized and are at high risk. We need to prioritize access to mental health services for people with severe mental health and disabilities. We must acknowledge that national and international public health authorities do have the resources, workforce, and IT capabilities needed to protect the health of people worldwide, and we need to prioritize that. When we discuss capacity building for and, and preparedness of the health workforce, considerations for services to support mental health and well-being cannot be overlooked. Increasing mental health services with particular focus on adequate numbers of personnel and ensuring required professional skills is an area of great need. A strong focus on community mental health programs and integration with primary care clinics and community services is key to reaching a larger proportion of the populations that need help and eliminating inequities. And one of the things that I have worked on really throughout my career has been that intersection between physical health and mental health. And we need to highlight that. It is very important to highlight the need for global and regional communication strategies that convey culturally competent and relevant, accessible and evidence-based information on mental health. Communication approaches that leverage research findings help facilitate greater understanding of the continuum of mental illness prevention and treatment, including the continuum of mental health wellness is necessary for optimal global mental health outcomes. In addition to a whole of society approach to promote, protect, and care for mental health, we should integrate a holistic life course approach as part of the larger promotion and protection and care for mental health. I want to emphasize the importance of a continued focus on substance use and drug use prevention and treatment. This is paramount to combat the rise in overdose deaths attributed to the pandemic. The United States is facing an overdose epidemic that has prematurely ended far too many lives and has worsened, actually worsened during the COVID-19 pandemic. More than 95,000 Drug overdose deaths are predicted to have occurred in the United States in the last 12 months, the highest number of overdose deaths ever recorded in a 12-month period, according to provisional data from the United States CDC. This alarming increase in overdose deaths underlines the need for more accessible prevention, harm reduction, treatment, and recovery services. Effective treatments for substance use conditions are do exist, and recovery is possible.
For far too long, people across the world have faced barriers navigating behavioral health systems. Underlying attitudes and stigma about mental health and substance use conditions only make it more difficult to find timely health. We must eliminate these barriers, eliminate stigma, and expand access to a full continuum of services. In conclusion, we are all in this together. And to get through this, we have to show compassion and support for each other globally. Now, I'm a positive and optimistic person, and I do believe that working together, we can come out of the COVID-19 stronger and more resilient and build a better future for our world's health. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Admiral Levine. I, I hope very much that this, uh, uh, this ending remarks of optimism are, are the ones that we will continue to discuss uh, during the open question and answer. And once again, a reminder to the audience, please post your questions. Um, in the Q&A box on the Zoom uh, window. Uh, I want to just emphasize uh, your, your, your remarks that, again, remind us of the inequitable uh, experience of poor mental health. But you also brought up certain groups that we don't often always acknowledge. Of course, frontline workers right through the pandemic um, are not just nurses and doctors, but also the many, many other kinds of people uh, and professions that are so essential to the running of our societies. For example, here in Boston, one of the most important frontline worker categories were people who operated the public transit system who have you know had to keep working even in the midst of the complete lockdowns um, the other group uh, two groups you reminded of us of we don't hear enough about and i will come back to this point in the discussion is people with serious mental illness and people with substance use conditions it's very interesting uh, the evidence is so strong now that these two groups of individuals are more likely to uh, to be infected by COVID-19 due to a variety of reasons, but also are more likely to die when they're infected than the general population. Therefore, you would assume that these would be uh, considered equivalent to the comorbidities that prioritize certain groups of individuals to get, for example, vaccination in many countries. But actually, I don't know any country which has included serious mental illness or substance use disorders as one of those priority groups. And again, this reflects perhaps in some ways, I think the lack of parity uh, between physical and mental health problems uh, in public policy, even in the COVID-19 pandemic. All three of our panelists have so far spoken about the workforce, and I think this is a subject we will come back to, but this is a great moment for me to introduce the fourth panelist, uh, Charlene Sunkel, who is the founder and the chief executive officer of the Global Mental Health Peer Network. Uh, Charlene is South African, and I believe she is actually joining us today from South Africa. Charlene, the floor is yours. Thank you so much uh, for including me and, and allowing me to give uh, lived experience perspectives on this specific and important topic. Yes, uh, I think COVID impacted on multiple levels on the lives of people with lived experience, uh, with mental health conditions, and really jeopardized uh, the recovery journeys of, of many people. Uh, navigating mental health care systems were difficult even before COVID, as we heard, because of the inadequate mental health care system and support services, uh, services that are not always aligned with uh, recovery and not always based on human rights. And of course, then there's uh, poor human and, and financial resources in mental health, which has really contributed and worsened, uh, were, were worsened by uh, the COVID pandemic. We as uh, people with lived experience, we've been through various challenges from uh, experiencing medication stockouts, which we did in South Africa, uh, suspended services, uh, inability to access services because of transportation restrictions at lockdown, uh, also because of financial difficulties in affording transportation and where medication stockouts were, couldn't afford to buy privately either. And of course, there were fear of being expo exposed to COVID at healthcare facilities. So people failed to follow up and access services at that uh, time. Uh, for those in uh, hospitals and residential care settings, I think we're also kind of forgotten, uh, especially where people have to share living spaces. 
which made it, of course, very difficult to practice precautionary measures uh, like physical distancing, for example. And many were disconnected from their social structures, like their families and friends, uh, because many of the facilities uh, prevented visitations from uh, outside people. Many from the more poorer communities and rural settings, for example, where they couldn't access community services, they couldn't really use or make uh, use of uh, kind of virtual services uh, because of financial constraints in terms of affording data and especially in rural communities or rural areas. If you look in South Africa, where almost 50% of your population lives in rural communities, uh, do not always have good internet connectivity. So that also made it difficult. Um, people experience, and I think I'm going to bring up the same word, inequalities, especially where it was concerning uh, the distribution of vaccines. Uh, we also heard about comor comorbid conditions uh, that many people with mental health conditions do have, and therefore at greater risk of severe illness and potential death from COVID. And what should have happened that vaccine distribution should have been prioritized for the lived experience communities. Registration process uh, for vaccinations was also a bit of a flaw in the system initially in what I've seen in South Africa and I'm sure in many other countries experience the same where the registration was uh, done online. Um, so that excluded a lot of people, uh, especially those uh, with no access or literacy of technology. Um, so that consideration wasn't made either. So based on, on the challenges, um, much of which could have been prevented or eliminated, or at least lessened the impact, um, if people with lived experience were included in decision-making processes related to the COVID response, and of course, right from the very start. Uh, not only would the impact on the individual be far less, but also the cost related to dealing with a whole new, if I can call it, new mental health pandemic uh, could also have been prevented. Uh, I think we heard this term mental health pandemic before, which it really is. So my organization, the Global Mental Health Peer Network, we initiated uh, an uh, engagement exercise with our lived experience members to determine how they managed to pull through the adverse effects of the COVID pandemic. Uh, what's interesting is that participants uh, shared that they found new recognition and the importance of family and friends as imperative to their support structure. Uh, several found that they have managed to build resilience and ability to deal with uncertainty, which could equip them for future crises. And many found various means of coping mechanisms uh, uh, for the pandemic, but outside of the mental health system. And the most valuable that they found was uh, peer support, uh, of course, among other activities such as taking up hobbies, exercise, meditation, yoga, spending time outside, outside of home specifically, and also to maintain social connection, uh, however, virtually. So from this, we can learn much about these personal discoveries of people with lived experience to take forward, which also emphasizes that we need to listen to people with lived experience, what they find beneficial and what they don't, uh, to truly build a mental health care system that gives people the means to overcome adversity and are able to thrive in life. So I want to pose two key recommendations in conclusion. First of all, to include people with lived experience meaningfully and authentically in all planning and decision-making processes and recognize the value and expertise of people with lived experience. And secondly, to integrate peer-led services, uh, specifically peer support work as part of the mental health workforce. That is from my end. Thank you so much. Over to you, Vikram.
Charlene, thank you so very much uh, for bringing this incredibly important stakeholder perspective to this panel discussion. Uh, I know all of us on the panel couldn't agree with you more uh, with those two recommendations that you ended with. Um, and of course, I just want to also remind ourselves that you don't have to be a declared peer to actually come out and support one another with a mental health problem, given how frequent these problems are. It's very likely that many of us have struggled with similar problems in our own lifetime. I do think though the point you make, which is extremely important, um, is that the services for people with serious mental health problems were greatly disrupted during the lockdown periods and, 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 and you know, also the stay at home and other kinds of policies. Uh, and I know that this is also partly related to the fact that we have seen a much greater rate of crisis admissions for people with mental health problems being reported in many parts of the world. And I also wondered, whether there was a link between this and the increase in uh, substance use related morbidity and mortality uh, that Admiral Levine spoke about uh, in her remarks. But I'm sure we'll turn back to this and um, particularly the way peer support can be, uh, can be harnessed uh, towards the goals that you describe in our Q&A. So the final uh, panelist, uh, it gives me great pleasure to welcome uh, Dr. Miranda Wolpert. Uh, Dr. Wolpert is the director of the mental health science stream at the Wellcome Trust, which is one of the world's largest uh, medical research funding bodies, uh, which I must acknowledge has also supported a lot of my own work in India over the last 30 years. Um, I uh, want to welcome uh, uh, Miranda, uh, who uh, will be speaking now, uh, perhaps about the role of the science community in addressing the intersection between mental health and COVID-19. Miranda, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And uh, fantastic to hear everyone's contributions up till now and great to be here. Um, uh, so uh, Welcome has just launched two reports last week that perhaps uh, uh, contribute to this debate. One is about the role of science in mental health, and the other is about what we know and what we don't know about a particular aspect of, of uh, mental health support in relation to anxiety and depression for young people. And I'm going to use those as ways of really to talk about what we see as the potential for science in this realm, particularly thinking globally, and thinking about the way that COVID has, sh has shone, a, shone a light on an um, epidemic that was there before, and is still there now. So in terms of the role of science in mental health, um, uh, Welcome has commissioned Gallup to undertake a survey of 113 different uh, countries across the world, 119,000 uh, people, and asked them about what their view was of the importance of mental health and the role of science in addressing mental health. And what they found from that was overwhelmingly across the globe, 92% of people said that mental health was as, as important or more important to their well-being as physical health. And one of the surprising findings that we found from that survey was that was even more strongly endorsed in low and middle income contexts as opposed to high income contexts. So it was very um, prevalent in low and middle income contexts for people to say mental health may even be more important to well-being than physical health. So something that really, I think, puts to bed the idea that somehow this is a high income country problem. This is a global problem for everyone across the world. And one, as we've all said, we need to find ways to address. What was less heartening in some ways was that people were less sure about the role of science in helping address that problem. So we found that around 53% of people surveyed globally thought that there was a big role for science in addressing things like infectious diseases or cancer but only about 30% saw the same role for addressing um, uh, issues around mental health and issues around obesity. Those more, uh, those slightly different sorts of issues, which are perhaps more of a tangle of social and uh, psychological and biological conditions. Uh, and what, where our second report comes in is that we are then trying to summarize what we do and don't know what the science has and hasn't shown in relation particularly to anxiety and depression and young people, which as people have said, is such a prevalent uh, problem. And what we're doing there as a funder is trying to bring together different perspectives from across the research community, to bring together those looking at the biology, those looking at the psychological aspects, and those looking at the social aspects, together as collaborators to really try and unpick what both causes, but also more importantly for us at this point, what can actually help address, prevent, or manage ongoing mental health difficulties. 
And what we've identified is a range of act, what we've called active ingredients. Those are the elements of interventions that actually make the difference, have the clinical impact in people's lives. And these range from things around changing the biochemistry of the brain through medication, right through to um, interventions that involve walking in nature or uh, uh, addressing loneliness. And we're trying to bring them to all of them the same rigor of approach to try and understand how they work and who they work for. And to go back to our survey of those uh, 119,000 people across the globe, we asked them which things they tried for their mental health. We asked, first of all, did many of them have mental health problems, particularly focused on anxiety and depression? And we found globally across the world about one in five said they had experienced anxiety and depression at some point generally starting before the age of 30. And then we asked them, what sort of things did you do to manage those mental health problems? And we gave them a list of eight options, which range from uh, changing lifestyle, to talking to friends and families, to walking in nature, to taking medication, to talking to professional. Not unsurprisingly, the vast majority of the world had, had used talking with friends and family. Less people had used uh, access to medication or to a professional. But what was really interesting was that majority of people had tried many different things and the majority of people had, had found at least some things helpful. So there seems to be a real agenda for us. And I think this is something we can really come together as a community to try and understand the full gamut of things that can be done to address mental health, some of which are absolutely essential within healthcare and within professional provision, and some of which sit currently in a slightly less regulated domain of self-care or community provision or community support. And I guess for welcome, we're interested in bringing the science to bear so we can understand that full gamut. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Miranda, for reminding us of the central role of science. Uh, so I, we are now going to open up into the Q&A and I can already see some questions that are, that are being posted. I'd invite all my colleagues on the panel to have a look at those so that they can think of which questions they might want to answer. But I'm going to take the prerogative as the moderator of this panel to ask my set of questions uh, to each of the panelists in turn. Uh, I want to start, uh, first of all, with you, Florence. Um, you know, very often we are told that um, there, we do not have enough guidelines and tools. We don't really know what interventions or how they should be delivered in diverse cultural and social contexts. Um, and even if we did, we just simply don't have the human resources to absorb the kind of financial investments that you spoke to. I'd like, you, I'd like to hear from you. Do you believe this is true? Florence, Thank please you. Me. Yes, oh. yes, I had not unmuted, sorry. Thank you. Um, yes, that's an important question because often um, we may not get funding because of those beliefs that maybe the guidelines aren't there or the actual interventions aren't there. But using the example of the special initiative, WHO, Director General's Special Initiative for Mental Health, which is now being implemented in eight countries, um, it is clear that countries actually do have the technical capacity to develop strategic frameworks and to implement them. All they need sometimes is just a little catalytic funding. Um, maybe a little technical assistance to provide guidance as to what to do when. For instance, um, what do you start with when you want to strengthen a mental health system? Is it uh, developing the packages of care or do you rush out into the community and try to begin to roll out a community mental health program? Obviously one would want to first define what the packages you're going to deliver do an assessment of who the, who the human resources are and what other resources are required and define these and package them and then begin to deliver. So that kind of uh, support is what the WHO Special Initiative for Mental Health is, is doing for countries in, in eight countries, but which can then be replicated. The information we are gaining now will be used to replicate in other countries all over the world. Um, another example is Kenya, which is not one of the uh, special initiatives for mental health, 
but the president of Kenya actually prioritized mental health and this alone galvanized the strengthening of mental health services. So within one year, they were able to pass an alcohol policy. They were able to develop a mental health strategic plan. Also, as a result of the COVID, the World Bank, I guess, because the World Bank saw the commitment of the government, the World Bank also supported the recruitment of over 130 uh, psychologists to provide psychological support. So a window of opportunity was taken by a champion in the Ministry of Health to spearhead the development of a mental health strategic plan and alcohol policy. Quality rights were strengthened, which streamlines a human rights approach throughout the delivery of mental health services. So that transformation is not being driven by outside actors, but the outside actors are catalytic to that transformation. WHO comes in and provides some of the resources required to develop the policy or strategic plan or the quality rights initiative, but we are not in the driver's seat. I will stop there for now. Thank you, Florence. And you know, it, it struck me when you use the word champions, it just seems to me that that is exactly what often is needed uh, to actually push a, a neglected issue up onto the front page. And I think um, it's, it's absolutely correct in my own experience as well, to have a champion in the Ministry of Health, whether it's a civil servant or a minister, uh, um, or a legislator, or legislator is such a powerful, uh, uh, you know, uh, opportunity. And I can say from uh, speaking uh, from my uh, from my experience of India, uh, it was you know India was lucky to have a champion who was an amazing uh, uh, civil servant actually who was in charge of health. And thanks to his championing, in fact, that India got the Mental Health Care Act, which is the first legislation that uh, entitles all people in India to receive mental health care through the public system. Let me turn now to uh, uh, Zainab. Zainab, you know, there's been a lot of conversation going on globally about the impact that the pandemic has had on children. And it's so, it's so important that UNICEF has published it for the first time its State of the World's Children Report focused on mental health. I'd like you to speak to us about more specifically what are the actions that UNICEF recommends for supporting children, not only those who have been affected by the pandemic, but also those who are struggling with other ongoing social uh, uh, disadvantages, such as displacement because of climate change or armed conflict, or just simply the bog standard living in poverty challenges of the world today. Uh, thank, thank you, Vikram. Um, and I mean, right, as you rightfully said at the beginning, you know, we are experiencing a global humanitarian emergency. So there's um, really so much to unpack there. But also, we, we cannot forget that, you know, the communities struck by COVID are communities, most, most of them have pre-existing issues that they are dealing with as well. Um, and children and young people and their families um, in humanitarian crises and per are particularly at risk of poor mental health and require targeted mental health and psychosocial support to, um, to address uh, the, the mental health issues that they might be dealing with. Um, and as children, of course, are affected by increasingly protracted crises compounded by COVID pandemic and other emergencies like we're dealing with right now in Afghanistan and Yemen and, other, and others, um, but also other types of emergencies like climate, the climate crisis, um, you know, we at UNICEF are urging governments and donors to scale up their support for mental health and psychosocial support in humanitarian situations, especially for children and those who are most vulnerable. Um, as part of our efforts to evaluate and learn from global COVID-19 response, and in order to inform and improve policy, um, work to drive results and prioritize advocacy efforts during um, a disease outbreak, um, we published a uh, child protection learning brief that focused on MHPSS. Uh, we identified five key strategies and learnings, um, or, as, or as I like to call them, relearnings, because these are things that we are learning time and time again, but we, we often struggle with the implementation. I think it's really critical that we 
uh, take stock of the mental health and psychosocial needs and available resources, really truly within each community, um, understanding the situation and the local context. And that is really critical for delivering um, services during COVID-19. Um, UNICEF and partners, we must take stock of the needs as much as the available resources and capacities to respond to those needs. Um, second, we need to be raising awareness and sharing information about mental health. Raising awareness um, is, is critical. Um, we need to be, and it needs to be a critical component of any response. Uh, in addition to policy, services, and investment, we need to work on changing the conversation and public perception on mental health and mental disorders. Um, you know, we talk a lot about stigma and tackling stigma at, at all levels. And it remains to be true that stigma remains a critical challenge to access to services, to um, ensuring a non-stigmatized way to make sure that the people who need the services are getting them. Uh, we, of course, need to deliver across sectors. Uh, we need to be move beyond. I think it's no longer acceptable to talk about mental health as part of health sector response alone. It needs to be an accountability across health, education, social welfare, and, and child protection. Uh, their flexibility, of course, in COVID-19 is critical as conditions change rapidly and continue to change. Uh, we need to be adapting services um, in many, I think I mentioned earlier how in many parts of the world, um, we still struggle with access to education. And so, uh, and we still struggle with physical distancing mandates. Uh, and those are, those present with really critical challenges. So we need to be working to adapt programs to reach children and families, including those who are on the move. Um, I think this was a really important learning that, that pushed agencies and governments, including in low uh, resources settings to develop new ways of working and innovative strategies so and not just digital to reach those who are most in need sadly this is not new to humanitarian emergencies um, but it is something that we are grappling with um, building uh, and finally building capacity of the workforce across sectors uh, we've we've heard this from uh, from the admiral as well I think it's really critical um, that we uh, prioritize this uh, in, in light of COVID, but this is something that is pre-existing, a uh, pre-existing challenge to mental health care, uh, and, and it should be increasingly perceived by governments as an essential part of uh, response and national mental health programming. Uh, so it, it is needed to uh, look at capacity building uh, for professionals and non-professionals working across sectors uh, in order to reach those who um, need those services. Well, thank you very much. Uh, you you know, you, you use the word workforce. This has come up almost all the time. And certainly in my conversations, in both in the US as well as in the global context, this is the question that comes up repeatedly. Um, and it is really about the point that we know what needs to be done. We know that these things can be done by a very diverse workforce, not just mental health professionals. But the challenge now is how do we actually move from that, that science of implementation into a real world impact scale up? Um, and hopefully there will be some, some thoughts that each of you might have in, as when, when we close off uh, to thinking about how do we build the workforce uh, uh, in all our different contexts. Let me turn to Rachel and Mira Levine. Uh, I, you, you've spoken very passionately about uh, the implications that the pandemic has had uh, on people already living with a mental illness and or a substance use disorder, uh, a group that I think we can all agree has been one of the most neglected in all conversations about uh, uh, addressing the needs of um, subgroups of vulnerable folks in the pandemic. So my pointed question to you is, uh, what actions has the US government taken to mitigate these negative outcomes, and in particular, get people closer to the care that they need? Well, Dr. Patel, thank you for, for that question. Yes, there have been so many challenges uh, to, for people with uh, mental health conditions, including substance use disorders during COVID-19. That includes significant barriers to care, especially during, uh, during the lockdowns. Um, worsening of acute and chronic conditions brought on by the pandemic-related prevention uh, measures uh, that, that we, we talked about, isolation, loneliness. Um, so our response has been um, several fold, and this is really a, a response across 
the Department of Health and Human Services as led by our, our secretary. Um, one specific is, is a lot of flexibilities in terms of uh, accessing care with an emphasis on telehealth. And so we have waived a number of different rules and regulations uh, for physical and specifically in, for, for mental health um, in terms of providing mental health telehealth services. Um, and, uh, and that has been very, very successful. Um, uh, we have to continue to address the health disparities associated for that because as been mentioned, uh, not everyone has access to computers or to broadband uh, and can access telehealth services completely. One way around that is to use um, uh, auditory only telehealth. You don't have to have visual uh, for those uh, those services to be provided. Uh, and we've had to make adjustments in terms of the complex reimbursement system that we have in the United States. Uh, another has been um, significant increase in funding uh, for our specific Substance Abuse Mental Health Service Association, or SAMHSA. Uh, SAMHSA has received um, uh, several billion dollars in extra funding to release to our states uh, through grants, half of which for mental health services and half of which for substance use disorder services. Um, one specific example that we can measure uh, mention is uh, I had uh, talked about the increase in overdose deaths uh, that we have seen. And so, you know, one of the very successful treatments for opioid use disorder um, is uh, more access to the medication called buprenorphine um, as medication for opioid use disorder. And so we have issued new practice guidelines uh, that has simplified uh, the administration of buprenorphine for treating opioid use disorder. And we've uh, uh, simplified the, the ability for medical uh, providers to be able to access Access uh, the the the, um, the ability to prescribe uh, that medication. Um, in addition, in terms of children's mental health services, um, we are working through many different aspects of health and human services, including our health services um, health um, resource services association, as well as the CDC, as well as research through the NIH, the Indian Health Service, etc., uh, to be able to have flexibilities for youth and their families to access care, and particularly as I mentioned, integrating that care into primary care services, and we're still working to, to continue and expand upon that. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it's so inspiring to know that the U.S. government is uh, investing in not just in words, but in such concrete ways with more money, but also clear directions on how uh, the services for people with mental health and substance use conditions should be organized. Uh, and I, I certainly hope that this is the kind of pattern that we see uh, at country level around the world. Let me now turn to uh, Charlene uh, Sankal. Charlene, you spoke very passionately from your perspective with, of the lived experience on the importance of peer support. And I'm sure many of us are intrigued about the practical ways in which peer support can be effectively integrated into the mental health care system. We'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Thank you so much, Victor. Yes, I think uh, when, when I speak about peer support, what we see, that it's quite common that we find peer support groups in low and middle income countries, I know, especially in South Africa, but peer support workers in terms of peer-to-peer -peer support um, you don't often, it's not actually very fully recognized yet in low and middle income countries. And it's actually such a pity because there's multiple benefits of peer support work. Um, for example, it can help close the human resources gap. It can help uh, have a greater services reach. Uh, it showed that uh, it, it has similar or even better health, uh, mental health outcomes uh, than professional services that also help to decrease uh, the need for specialized care, which of course is cost-saving benefit. Um, I think what's also important is that it gives empowerment and hope to a person, which ultimately also helps them uh, to gain better, to kind of thrive in their lives. I think what is important, um, especially in contexts where peer support work is not yet recognized. Uh, I think the, the training, training is important um, to have, if we're now talking about formal peer support work, uh, to be integrated within systems. But I think training is important and especially within local context. Um, for example, if we're gonna develop uh, peer support training in South Africa, 
Uh, there's already a lot of trainings being developed in high income countries from other countries, excellent groundwork being done. So it's easy for us to actually take that training and adapt it to kind of the local context because we've got a lot of issues to consider like culture and so on. Now, it's also important that peer support work uh, are paid roles, like being recognized as equally valuable as an occupation than any other health uh, worker or mental health worker, because peer support work can be integrated into various uh, areas of mental health. I mean, at community-based clinics, primary health care uh, systems, hospitals, uh, crisis intervention teams, emergency rooms, uh, especially uh, community outreach programs. Um, but I think you, you mentioned uh, earlier about the workplace and peer support work can be equally valuable in the workplace, but also in terms of schools and universities as well. Um, I think what's important to facilitate this recognition of peer support work, especially where it's not in existence yet, is that it needs to be incorporated within mental health policy. Uh, and strategic plans just to make sure that it actually happens and people with lived experience being fully involved in this process of establishing and implementing uh, peer support work. Thanks. Well, thank you, Charlene. It's so helpful to hear these very specific concrete ways in which peer support could be integrated. Uh, I wanna now turn to Miranda. Uh, so Miranda, it was really useful to hear about these results that you cited. I actually looked at the report very closely and, uh, you know, there were two findings that, that stood out. I think you, you, you spoke to both of them. The first was that um, mental health was often seen as being as important uh, as physical health by the vast majority of respondents. But then also uh, that science was not seen to be as valuable in, in addressing questions about mental health as much as they were for physical health. So my, my question to you is, were you surprised uh, by, by these findings? And, and secondly, as you know, the head of one of the world's biggest science funding bodies, uh, what is, what is um, for mental health, what is, what is your plan on how to address this, this public um, uh, lack of confidence in science uh, uh, to, 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 to help us unpack the mental health puzzle? Thank you. Um, uh, and thank you also for your support, Vikram, because you were one of our advisors on this project, so we're very grateful for your input. Um, uh, I think we were surprised by the extent globally that people endorsed the importance of mental health to them, and that was across all countries, across all the world. Um, and I think we had expected more variation in that, and there to be areas where people, because I think we'd all thought maybe of the stigma of mental health or, or not understanding what mental health uh, role might be that that would be less of an issue but actually it was such a clear finding across the whole world that was a surprise and it was a surprise how strongly it was endorsed uh, particularly in in low resource settings low middle income country context so that was a, of great interest I think the the fact that that people are less certain about the role of science perhaps is more understandable and I wouldn't want to overstate it if you put the we had a number of different ways of phrasing the question and if you put the question together with, um, has it got some role to play? Then most people think it's got some role to play, but they're less certain whether it's got a major role to play in the way that they are more certain with more physical, uh, more, more clearly physical problems. And I guess, um, as you say, it is something I think a lot about as my role in Welcome, in terms of how can we make sure, how can we bring to light the really exciting findings that are across science and, and have we failed in some way by not doing so up till now? So one of part of my agenda is to make sure the amazing science that's coming through, right through from the basic translational, is more available for the public, people are more aware, and they're more aware of how it's informing treatments and approaches now, and how it can change their lives. So that's one agenda. And that's an agenda really for us as communicators of the fantastic science that exists. The second agenda, I think, is, is us of conveners of the fantastic scientists, who currently perhaps are doing science within their own particular areas, but not perhaps always talking across fields to each other. So we need to get the fantastic biologists, the cell biologists and the others to talk with the sociologists. We need to get the people who are doing uh, data analysis 
to talk with the people who are doing uh, cognitive testing. We need to get all of that together so that we can really transform the ways we can understand how best to prevent and treat mental health problems. And I guess that's our agenda going forward for the next how many years uh, as we go forward. Well, thank you, Miranda. I, I look forward to that uh, forward-looking agenda that you just alluded to. But we are now in the last 20 minutes of this fascinating discussion. I can see there have been a bunch of questions that people have, have posed from the, the attendees, um, but all of my panelists have been remarkably uh, proactive and responded to them in writing. Uh, I, would be, I would welcome if any of the panelists would like to speak up in response to any of the questions in the Q&A box, but also I would invite the panelists, if you have any questions for one another, to please use your hand signal. Uh, and Florence, first off the mark, thank you so much. Florence, over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, it was really, really, um, I'm just so glad I was able to uh, participate in this. It's been amazing being here. I just have uh, two questions. One is for Zainab. I actually read the, the State of the World's Children and it was, I was very encouraged to see that the return on investment or on, school mental health programs, mental health, uh, universal mental health promotion and mental health prevention programs is really very, very high. And I wonder whether um, what that looks like for countries, especially for low-income countries. I don't know whether this study was done in high-income countries alone. I know that the return on investment is good there, but I don't know whether for low-income countries as well, it is just as good and what exactly would it involve? And is this an area that UNICEF believes they are going to be investing more in? If I may also put a question to, to, um, to Charlene, um, I, I like the idea very much of peer support workers and um, mentioning that peer support workers is not peer support groups. And I think that is a very important um, difference to make because very often we encourage the peers to create groups and then we step away and we expect them to run themselves in the groups and that is supposed to do something. But moving away from that and going into maybe supporting families proactively, because for us in the African region, as you very well know, especially with the experience of South Africa and trying to get people out of institutions and into communities and how that kind of, you know, didn't go as was anticipated. Do you see any value in maybe those resources being paid to families and families also getting support in training and capacity building so they can be the carers of people with um, maybe severe and chronic mental health conditions. So those are the two questions I would have. So Zainab, I, I'll, I invite you to respond to the question to you. And you know, there is another question that's been posted in the Q&A. If you have a chance to maybe uh, tackle that one as well, that would be great. That sounds good. Thank you, Vikram. And thank you, Florence, for that for that question. And I hope uh, I do it justice, but it seems that you're specifically asking about some of the um, information and the findings within the SOWC that spoke to the economic impact of child mental health problems. Uh, and if I, if I do get that correctly, I think it will be important maybe to mention quickly for the audience here that in the report, we explore two main questions. The first is the cost of inaction. So the new analysis indicates that the annual loss in human capital arising from mental health conditions in children ages 0 to 19 is $387.2 billion. Um, and uh, of the 300 of that is 300 uh, is 340.2 billion, um, where an anxiety disorders account for 26.93%. 
behavioral disorders for 22.63 and depression for 21.87%. Uh, and so essentially what this research confirms is that as well as the human costs of ignoring, ignoring children's mental health, there is a there is a dev devastating economic cost as well. The second question that the report um, explores is what is the human what what is the return on investment in children and adolescent mental health? And so we feature an analysis which indicates that school based interventions and this speaks to your question as well, Florence, is, well, what, what, what can we actually do? So the, the analysis is, looks at school-based interventions that address an anxiety, depression, and suicide. And it shows that those interventions provided a return on investment of $21.5 for every $1 invested over 80 years. And so together, the two analyses provide a really clear case for governments to better respond to mental health needs of children. Um, but I do like to always put a caveat there and say, you know, does everything come down to money? Absolutely not. While in conversations around investment, we are conditioned, I think, to think about returns in terms of monetary value and how investments will prove beneficial in the long term. We must not forget the returns on the individual if we invest in mental health, which will be invaluable. So we must always place the individual at the forefront of the conversations and our calls to action, which is why in the SOWC, we frame our recommendations around, yes, the bigger policy asks and, and, and calls for investment to government, but then really practical um, solutions and calls for uh, prioritization of mental health within primary health care, within schools and within communities, and a focus on prevention and promotion where we know that investment is going to yield the best returns. So not just absolutely focusing our attention on care and treatment, but where, we, but starting early where we can start to prevent those longer term uh, mental health issues. Thank you. Um, I, I think your colleague has already answered the question, I believe, uh, on uh, that, that that was placed in the box, but maybe if we have time, you can turn the circle back at Zenab and I, I will I will move on to uh, Charlene to answer the question uh, that uh, Florence posed to Charlene. Thank you, Florence. Yes, I think we also can think a bit out of the box of, of you know, what we can utilize peer support workers for. The way I see it is that it can be used to train, provide training as well to, to your family members. Funny enough, in the last while, I received so many calls from uh, relatives, families whose children or someone close to them contacted me for advice. And it's always interesting how they don't know how to approach the situation. And I think a peer can offer good advice in terms of that. For example, sometimes very simple, just ask the person what they want, because like they wanted to set up a meeting, for example, with me, plus the parents. Now they want to know, must the parents be there or must the person be there, the service user alone? So I always say, just ask the person what they want. And sometimes simple things also help the parents. Secondly, what I found, I found it a bit counterproductive to have, uh, I've seen like support groups where service users and families are in one support group. I find it doesn't really work because the parents raise their issues and then, you know, the service users don't like it because, you know, it, sometimes there's a bit of friction. Um, uh, but I can see that, in terms of peer support groups for parents that I've seen work very well where parents support each other as well. But I also feel that in terms of uh, family support groups itself, um, to always include someone with lived experience to also come and speak to them from lived experience perspectives and, and give them that type of advice. So I do see more roles or not as you know, normally prescribed as what a peer support worker should be, but I think a bit more broad, broadly in terms of uh, training of uh, parents and relatives as well. Thanks. Thank you very much, Charlene. So uh, again, uh, if there, any of our, my fellow panelists have any questions for one another, please do use the hand signal. Uh, let me see, there's another question. No, there are no more questions in the Q&A box. So, um, I'm going to maybe, as we are in the last 10 minutes of this panel, really ask each of each of you, and I'm also going to perhaps, uh, 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 you know, join you in this, um, for each of you to think about uh, 
what might be the, the most low hanging fruit opportunity for building back better a mental health care system. I think we all acknowledge that there were very significant gaps in mental health care delivery. Let's leave aside prevention for now. Let's just think about in these last 10 minutes, the care of people, children, young people and adults with mental health problems. We knew there were very large gaps even before the pandemic and those gaps were associated with enormous disparities as well. Uh, the usual groups that we always know are disadvantaged having a disproportionate lack of access to good quality mental health care. Uh, what the pandemic has offered, I think we'll all agree, is a historic opportunity uh, for, uh, for building back not just our mental health care systems, but actually our health care systems more generally. But I'd like each of us to maybe just think about what might be the most attractive, the most tractable, the most uh, politically acceptable uh, a strategy to build back better the mental health care systems of the future. Uh, and I'm going to start in reverse order now. Uh, so let, let me start with, uh, you know, we shouldn't privilege only the um, alphabetical order in one direction. So let's start with the other order, uh, the other direction with you, Miranda. Thank you, great question. So I think uh, actually inspired by what Shai and others are saying, I think building back Becca has to build the people who were trying to serve and help as co-creators in the solutions. And I think we have an opportunity also to build back systems that allow them not just to be co-creators and solutions, but also in greater advancing understanding. So for me, if you're talking about the radical transformation, I think we need to see in healthcare, we see, need to see healthcare as a platform in which we're both providing solutions, but also learning about new solutions through randomized trials, through trial platforms that I think have revolutionized cancer care. And we need the same for mental health. We need the same attitude where if we don't know what's the best thing to do, we need people to be up for being in trials and we need uh, people who are most affected to be helping design and be involved and helping us find the next generation solutions. Thank you, Miranda. Uh, Charlene. Yeah, I would say my response would be pretty much the same as, as what Miranda said. Definitely let uh, people with lived experience guide uh, policy and practice. Um, funny enough, in the in the peer network, we had a discussion around uh, COVID and we always said that we can actually help those a lot who has now experienced new mental health problems because we've been through it. So... Uh, I think we can add great value in, in terms of that. And again, in terms of peer support work, that definitely would be a big added value in terms of dealing with issues. Thank you. Thank you. Rachel. Well, thank you for that question. Um, I think that uh, improvements in systems of care um, are one of the uh, uh, the advantages or some of the thing, lessons that we've learned uh, through the pandemic and can, uh, and can, as you said before, and as our president says, build back better. Uh, the first is, is telehealth, as I mentioned before, and telemental health. I think that it that the, the pandemic has has um, spurred that on uh, tremendously um, and shown how useful it can be. Uh, we need more research on it, uh, but I think that that telehealth is here to stay. Um, it has highlighted the health equity component in terms of access to broadband devices, et cetera. But I think that that's not going away and we need to, uh, to make sure that that we um, uh, improve and continue the update and regulations to, uh, to, to continue to foster that. Uh, the other system of care is the integration of, of mental health services into physical health, particularly, but not exclusively in primary care. And so I know that we have been working to do that in pediatrics and we need to do that in terms of our community health centers and family medicine clinics and internal medicine clinics as well, is to embed mental health professionals in the primary care clinics um, so that it is all one system of care. Thank you. Um, I think the next person will be Zainab. Thank you, Vikram. And I think I'm going to steal one of Miranda's talking points about science, because I, I really do feel as we move forward, uh, we need to let the science also drive our direction. And we need to be safeguarding the promotive preventive treatment continuum. And um, really, I, I think what we know now to be true, and what we've known for a very long time is that we need to be focusing 
on early intervention as much as we can. I think um, bringing an end to neglect, abuse, and childhood adversities that drive poor mental health and life outcomes, I think is critical. And this builds on the latest evidence and, and I think brings together um, advocacy on mental health, violence and early childhood development in one coherent and tangible uh, strategy for implementation. Uh, and so in my hope uh, in kind of moving things forward in addition to all the wonderful recommendations is to be true to that and really kind of focus our energy on early intervention and supporting caregiver mental health as part of that through family-focused interventions and school-based interventions as well. Thank you. Florence. Thank Florence. you very much. And um, being the last one this time, I will likely repeat what others have said. I would say um, it has to be two-tiered. One is we need um, one of the low lying fruit, I would say, is, is um, in order to strengthen financing, because that's one big gap area, is to urge that there's an investment, that there's a financing of the UN Multipartner Trust Fund for NCDs and mental health, which was created in May of this year. The three partners are UNDP, uh, UNICEF and WHO. And since we have this financing mechanism, I would urge that the funds be put in there and then um, we would be able, we would be able to streamline and strategically approach how these funds are then allocated to, um, to support countries to catalyze what it is that they are doing. Uh, also to expand the domestic fiscal space for mental health. So it's, a, it's an ideal platform for donor country, countries, foundations, and other public and private funders. So that would be one. The second tier, I think, is on systems, and people have touched on this one, the low-lying fruit. The first one is the area that Charlene talked about, strengthening the role of peers to provide support and I think actually remunerating them and building the capacity of peers so that their role is much more than a voluntary. They don't only belong in the voluntary space, but they need to be actual partners in that sense and, and families as well, especially for low-income countries where the social service side of things is often very, very weak. We don't want to set up parallel community mental health structures that are going to be underfunded. And therefore I would urge that we look for other mechanisms to deliver services to, to the people who need them as close to their homes or within their homes if possible. The other one is of course taking advantage of the school systems because most, most countries up to 90% of young people are in school. So if we could reach them through the school, School mental health promotion and prevention is a very good way we could reach a big number of people very, very quickly. Strengthening and the last and most important one for me because of where I am seated is strengthening mental health in the emergency response. Unfortunately, I feel like we have talked about it, we have recognized it, but still mental health does not, it seems to be, you know, very a little vague in how it is it is addressed and responded to. I think we need to be much more clearer in what we do in mental health within emergencies, within the humanitarian response. I think we need a much more solid response there. So I will stop there. Thank you, Florence, and to all my panelists. Let me wrap up by just simply making a clarion call to say that this is a historic opportunity to invest, to redouble our commitment and investment in mental health care. But what we've heard from all our panelists is that we need more than just more money because we need to make sure that that money is spent wisely. The system that existed before the pandemic needed to be reformed. And that is what we really should be focusing on now so that the reformation happens guided by the best science and adhering to the principles of social justice. And for me, the single most important opportunity to do this is to expand, as we've heard from many of you, 
the understanding of mental health care beyond narrowly defined biomedical disorder entities to embrace the diversity of mental health experiences, for example, opening the door to support and care for people who may not meet diagnostic threshold criteria. And in relation to that, to expand the diversity of strategies and human resources who can be deployed to support the mental health care mission of all countries. I'd like to thank all my panelists for the fantastic discussion we've had today. I believe the event will and is being recorded uh, and hopefully there will be many others who will listen in, in later, uh, later on uh, for, for, for really getting a sense of the great discussion we had today. Thank you all very much and have a wonderful rest of your day. Bye-bye.